there will be trials. Such a graphic lesson I've had to learn in the physical realm. You know, I'm just now getting to where I can walk without limping. And it's been 14 months since my knee was operated on. For over eight months, there was no exercise on my right leg. And I went to Dr. Gary Tuthill, and he, you know, I'd done some calisthenics, physical things. He said, look, boy, if you want to walk, you've got to start really putting some exercise on those muscles. They've atrophied. And there is no way that you'll walk unless you really go through some rigorous exercise. And, you know, I started doing it. And, you know, it's exactly the same with our faith. How many of you have your faith virtually atrophied because you haven't been under any stress or at least related with faith to the stress and believe God? You see, faith is like a muscle. It doesn't stay static. You're either growing in your faith or you're retarding in your faith. You don't stay at one point. It's never status quo. And the Bible tells us that God allows trials into our life because that's the exercise that forces faith to grow. Without stress, without trial, your faith will not grow. You know, what I did in the late great 20th century, I was astounded because it just kind of gathers up all the things that began to happen in the 20th century. Like we rode into the 20th century on horseback. We rode out on space vehicles. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, when we went into the 20th century, the, the uh, most deadly form of military action was a cavalry charge. When, when we came out, uh, and they came in with horse-drawn cannons, we came out with intercontinental ballistic missiles with right. multiple warheads. That's right. I mean, you know, you just begin to see how all of this has changed today with the advent of computers they say the entire base of western knowledge doubles every six months what is america's role as this all unfolds well i've been studying prophecy now for 46 years and one of the most disturbing things to me art is that as you look at the lineup of nations in the last configuration they, they the bible has ways of predicting nations that exist today and as i look at this there is nothing even intimated about the united states mm. now many other nations are definitely predicted mm -hmm. but there is absolutely nothing about the united states being a significant power even to be mentioned in the last days now that has bothered me because that means that one, we will be diminished in power to the point where we will not be a significant power. One thing we know for sure is that the power of the West must shift to Europe in a revived Roman Empire with Rome as its capital. Hmm. And I see the, you know, I've been looking for, for 46 years, I look for the United States of Europe to appear even though they had tried it for centuries and it never worked. I believe the EU is the beginning. So we may not even be part of the final act. We may not be, because we could well be destroyed before that. And so when this happened on 9-11, hmm. that really set some bells off. Because just four months before that, I had just made the video called Where is America in Prophecy? And I said that if I'm correct, something catastrophic is going to happen to the United States soon. And that was when? When did you say that? I said that four months before November 11. September 11. Uh, September 11. September 11. Oh, my. It's kind of like when the clouds are gathering static electricity just before an electric storm and a thunderbolt burst loose. That's what I see it as right now. I see these... Islamic fundamentalists gathering power quietly, like static electricity being gathered in a cloud, a thundercloud. And all of a sudden, without warning, there's a massive thunderbolt. And I believe that's about the way it's going to happen. I really do believe, first of all, in, in a democracy that treasures freedom like we do, it's virtually impossible to protect ourselves against a, de a determined enemy 
that is willing to give his life to hit us. There just happens to be hundreds of thousands of people like that that are trained, dedicated, and ready to give their life to do significant damage to us. And I think it's only a matter of time so then all of before that they use a nuclear device on us. Uh, apparently so. I wanted to ask you about these horsemen of the apocalypse. What sort of modern interpret? How, how do you imagine that? Well, those are, of course, allegorical figures that are yes. depicting something. I, I can reel them off here. First, the first horseman is the man on the white horse who comes forth with a crown conquering. And that is the Antichrist. That's depicting the judgment where the Antichrist is going to be turned loose on the world. And the world's going to think he's the best man that's ever lived. He's the, he's the answer. He's the one that's going to bring the world out of this terrible period of war. And by the way, why do you believe he is alive now? What leads you to believe he is alive now? Because of the development of the scenario, the predicted scenario. It's at the time point right now where he has to be alive in order to fit in with the timing okay. of, the, of the prophetic scenario. And then there's the second horseman, it's, uh, the red horse. This horseman depicts the, the fact that it says he takes peace from the earth. Now that means there must have been a period of peace so this would be the peace that the Antichrist right. establishes. Right. And so it says that uh, he takes peace from the earth and provides that men should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. Well, in the original Greek, the word slay is not the normal word. It's a word for utterly slaughter. He says... And a great sword is given. Of course, the sword in, in ancient literature is a symbol of weapons. And it says it's a great sword. So this means that in this war, today's, there today's, will be tremendous weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, it could be a hydrogen bomb. Yes. Today. So it says that it will take much life. And then the third horseman is a black horse. It, he appears with a scale in his hands. And he says, he heard a voice saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Well, a denarius in that day was the average wage of the average worker. So it means a day's wage would buy one quart of wheat or three quarts of barley. And it says, do not touch the oil or the wine, which is the luxury thing. So... I believe that this one is talking about the great scarcity of food. Once war breaks out, there will be a tremendous scarcity of food worldwide. And then the fourth horseman is the one that's ashen or deadly or a deathly pale horse. And it says the one that sat on that is death and Hades. And it says that he will kill a fourth of the population of the earth with sword, which means with the weaponry of war, with famine, with plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So it's pretty grisly. If you knew with absolute certainty, Hal, where the Antichrist was right now, what would you do? Well, I would do everything in my power to unveil who he is and what he's going to do. But see, in, in, in my understanding of Bible prophecy, I will never know who this man is because I'll be taken out of the world before he is unveiled. All man's big wars have been about belief and religion. and oh, I agree. Listen, I agree with that. And that's why I don't believe that true Christianity is a religion. See, religion is man seeking to gain God's acceptance by what he does, earn, to earn God's acceptance through his merit. Christianity says man has no merit and can never be good enough for God to accept. Mm -hmm. And so we simply receive a gift of pardon that God offers us, and this puts us into a living personal relationship with God. It's not something you have to strive for. And 
and it's it's a personal relationship. It's not going about you know trying to do things in order to earn God's acceptance. And God changes us from within rather than us trying to change ourselves by our own good, good deeds and by our own self-will. Well, I guess, Hal Lindsay would be just a person to ask about this. So many Christians uh, today are turning from the pre-tribulation rapture to begin to believe in a post-tribulation uh, rapture. My own studies lead me to this conclusion as well. What do you think? Well, I think that people need to study why they're doing That's why I wrote this new book called Vanished. I go into the scriptures on those things. I believe that, you know, if you compare scripture with scripture, you find the one position that's virtually impossible is the post-tribulation rapture. The reason is because when Christ says he comes for the believer, that every believer is snatched up to meet him and changed from mortal to immortal. Now, if that takes place at the end of the tribulation, at the second coming, that means that every living believer will have just been taken off the earth and, and translated into immortality. Then you run into trouble with Matthew chapter 25, where it says that the first thing Christ does when he returns to the earth in the second coming is he divides the believers from the unbelievers. Well, if the rapture had just taken place, that would have already been done. Mm -hmm. And only the believing survivors go into the new kingdom to repopulate the earth. If the rapture had just occurred, you'd have no mortals that could bear children. That'd all be immortals. So that's just one of the reasons I take up in my new book, The Vanished, and I think that I think that uh, the biggest problem is people do not know exactly what is taught about any of these views anymore. How are we to believe that the Bible is accurate? How? I mean, how do we know? I'll tell you how. I, I, you know, when I uh, first believed in, in Jesus Christ, I was a tugboat captain and very skeptical. Really? Yeah. And I was in New Orleans. Had no religious background whatsoever. And so I became a believer, and I knew that something extraordinary had happened to me because all of a sudden, after I prayed and received this gift of pardon that Jesus talked about, there was this almost instant awareness that I could understand some of the things the Bible was talking about. And I realized I'd received the spiritual birth it talked about. But I still had a problem with being able to believe that the Bible was some sort of a supernatural book. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I heard a lecture at Rice University in Houston, which was my home originally, I heard this scholar speak at Rice University, and he talked about Bible prophecy. And I thought, man, that's extraordinary. He's a scholar, and he's talking about this. And he pointed out that the only book in the world that has a system of prediction and has had a 100% accuracy in fulfillment of those predictions is the Bible. So I started studying it, and that is what convinced me the Bible was the Word of God. I just saw that hmm. history proved that it, was, it had to be supernatural because these prophets at different times would make these predictions about certain, uh, a certain event. And they would all come true. That's and, the part. And history, history was the record. Yes, the reading and seeing the prophecy that has come true and is coming true right. worries me. <laughs> I can't say that it has convinced me, yeah. but it worries me deeply. <laughs> well, it should trouble you. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> because if the past is true, the, the future will be true. In 2002, President George Bush asked Congress to give him authority to use any means necessary against Saddam Hussein. On this day in 2002, the Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein formally informed the U.S. that it had no weapons of mass destruction. In 2004, former President Bill Clinton underwent successful heart bypass surgery.
and it says that he rides forth and the rider's name is death and hell and they're joined together you know death should hold no fear for a believer in Jesus Christ it's not a pleasant thing I'd just soon avoid it if I could but you don't see people out there having organizing marches against death it's kind of futile but there's a good chance that you and I might miss it because Christ says he's going to come just before the seven-year period begins and snatch out every living believer in him and snatch us up to meet him and he's going to take us to the Father's house and he's preparing a place for us to dwell right now. And it's a great building program, I'm sure. <laughs> now, <clears throat> chilling things are said about this writer that's called Death and Hell. I want to say something to you. I think I've said it bef before. But one day I was sitting studying the third chapter of the Gospel of John about the fact that men and women must be born again. And I was thinking, and then I remembered in Revelation chapter 20, it talks about blessed and holy are those who have believed in Jesus Christ because over them they will not suffer the second death and it, it hit me he who is born once shall die twice but he who is born twice shall die but once so make sure you've been born twice Chapter 6, verse 1. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Go! You see, this Greek word can either mean come or go. He didn't say come. He said go. And that's true of all of these. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. First of all, the best thing, uh, best tool to have in interpreting the Bible is a sanctified curiosity. I have six friends that taught me everything I know. Who, what, when, where, what, and so what. <laughs> okay. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now here's a lawyer that's never lost a case. And he doesn't fleece you for defending you, as I have been fleeced on many occasions. <laughs> you know, I was musing about this as I did an ad lib close on my television program, this to be shown on Sunday. And it just struck me the holy i was wondering what am i going to say and i you know i never prepare beforehand i always count on the holy spirit to tell me what to say and boom it just hit me that he brought to remembrance something that had struck me as a young believer i was looking for evidences that this book was supernatural one of the most incredible evidences that this book has to be supernatural is because this is not the way a man would write about himself. If, if this book was sourced in man, he would never have written it. You read every other religious book, 
And it will always give the idea that coming, uh, coming to God or coming to perfection is by you working for it, by you earning it. But with God, he says, all of our righteousnesses, plural, are as filthy rags in his sight. Now, that's not what a man would dream up. We'd always hold out something. I mean, surely I help some way. Well, a lot of, a lot of churches believe that. But it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done as he saved us, but by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. For by grace, which means something that cannot be deserved, by grace, through faith, You have been saved, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In the midst of trying to keep up with all of this, I traveled to Las Vegas last week for the wedding of one of my daughters. I was shocked by the number of strangers who stopped to ask me questions about Bible prophecy. You know, I'm not often stopped like that, and this was Las Vegas. Vegas is not known to have an interest in the Bible, to say the least. 